Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Um, my name is Alberta Newton, and I'm from the New England Queen QIO. I will be your moderator for today's webinar, Calculating Costs, Deep Dive into the NIPS Cost Performance Category. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping items. This call will be recorded for training purposes. I'll provide you with details on accessing the recording at the end of this webinar. Phone lines will be on mute for the duration of the presentation. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. At that time, I will provide you with instructions on how you can ask a question over the phone. You can also pose a question in the chat box throughout the presentation. Please make sure to send your questions to all participants. Today's presenter is Lula Walensky from the New England Queen QIO. She's an administrator and regional lead. And at this time, I'm turning the presentation over to Lula. Thank you, Alberta. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Calculating Costs, Deep Dive into the NIPS Cost Performance Category. Before we get started, I just want to quickly go over the disclaimer. So all of the content in today's presentation is from CMS-generated materials. However, these slides were put together by us, so just keep that in mind. Quick overview of today's presentation. I have just a very brief update on something related to the general MIPS participation and actually APM participation in the quality payment program for 2018. Then I'll just briefly talk about the MIPS performance categories, and then we'll really dive into the cost performance category in particular. We're going to talk briefly about why we need to evaluate costs. We'll also dig into the two measures, the Medicare Spending Per Beneficiary, or MSPB measure, as well as the Total Per capita Cost, or TPCC measure. I'm going to talk to you a little about uh, getting familiar with your data, so we'll look at what the current data on a quality and resource use report, or QRUR report, looks like, and then we'll also talk about some cost containment strategies. We have some resources at the end, and then obviously time for questions. You're more than welcome to enter questions into the chat as we go along, and then we'll also open up the lines at the end, so if you have questions, then you can ask them over the phone. Just briefly before I get started, I just want to let you all know this is an incredibly technical topic. As I'm sure most of you are already familiar, cost is sort of that nebulous CMS topic that has very complex algorithms related to patient attribution and scoring. Today, I'm going to be providing you with a basic overview of how your score is generated and how those patients are attributed to your, your, your personal practice, if you're in a solo practice, or your group, if you're reporting as a group. But due to the nature of the way the score is generated and all of that algorithm in the back end, I won't actually be able to provide you with the information on how to actually calculate your score. One, because it's a full year of claims data that you probably don't have for 2018. In fact, I know you don't have for 2018. And two, because it's a really complex topic that CMS likes to keep pretty close to their chest in the end. Um, so just keep that in mind as, as we talk through this. Just briefly, acronyms you'll hear. You've probably seen most of these now that we're in year two of the Quality Payment Program. Uh, some that you'll see a lot today are QPT, the Quality Payment Program. Uh, again, Medicare Spending Per Beneficiary, MSTV. TPCC is the Total Per Capita Cost. And then we'll talk briefly again about the QRURs, which are the Quality and Resource Use Reports. So my quick program update, the 2018 NIPS Participation Lookup Tool has been updated. If you go to the CMS, uh, kpp.cms.gov website, you can actually now pull up APM participation for your various clinicians. This is a great new tool, new addition to the tool that CMS added a couple weeks ago. So now if you have APM participants, you don't have to go to that second data.cms.gov website to get the APM participation. You can go right off that one NIPS participation, or I guess now it should be the QPP participation lookup tool, and find out all the information. There still is data at the bottom of the screen with special status updates. So if the special status has been updated or your clinicians might fall into one of those special status designation groups, make sure you check that as well because that has implications for their reporting. All right, cost time. So, MIPS for 2018, here are the performance categories. Just a quick overview. 
quality is now at 50% of your MIPS score. Again, you're expected at the current time to report for a full calendar year of data. Promoting interoperability, or as you might remember it was advancing care information, is still 25% of your MIPS score, and that's reporting for at least a 90-day reporting period. Improvement activities account for 15% of the MIPS score, and that's also a 90-day reporting period at least. And then cost. So cost is that lovely new category that got introduced in 2018. For those of you who reported in 2017, cost was 0%. For 2018, it comprises 10% of your final MIT score. And you do have to report for a full calendar year of data. Now we'll talk a little more about the data and the requirements. But also keep in mind, so 2018, 10% of your MIT score based on the final rule and then that subsequent bipartisan um, Budget Act that came out in February, CMS is allowing for the cost category to remain at 10% or maybe slightly increase over the next two years, but it doesn't actually have to become 30% of your MIT score as it was initially supposed to be by 2019. You now have actually until 2022 before that has to go into effect. So luckily, you still have time to get used to this category, see how it feels. It's still 10%, which is 10% of your full score, but not a huge chunk, um, a third of it, if it was going up to that 30%. Also, within the Bipartisan Budget Act, there was um, a component that took out the improvement scoring. So initially, both quality and cost were going to get improvement scores. That improvement scoring for cost has been removed at least until 2022 based on current legislation. All right, so some key pieces of information to keep in mind when you're looking at the cost performance category. So as I mentioned, it accounts for 10% of your MIPS score. It replaced the value-based payment modifier from uh, the PQRS days. And it also is a 12-month reporting period, so it's the full calendar year of 2018. Now, as I mentioned, keep in mind, you're not actually submitting data. Really, the way this works is that CMS automatically pulls data from your Part A and Part B claims and does their back-end algorithm on patient attribution and calculating your cost rate from that data and utilization information as well. So why do we evaluate cost? You're probably thinking, why is this category even needed? CMS has all my data. They can see how I perform. They have it. They can adjust things. I'm already getting maybe a penalty or I'm getting a small incentive. What does this matter? Well, as all of you know, healthcare costs continue to increase, and they increase at an exponential rate. So CMS is looking at costs and utilization because they need to curb spending. The other piece is that in looking at cost and utilization, there's a way for CMS to evaluate efficiencies relative to those different efficiencies in the process of the national median. So how do you compare to your fellow peers, either in similar peer groups or to that national average of spending and utilization? And as many of you also know, we're looking at care transitions and better coordination of care, making sure patients uh, who maybe have been hospitalized, get back to the home setting effectively, and then they, they don't get readmitted to the hospital within that 30-day window, or hopefully for quite some time after they've been admitted. So improving transitions and coordination of care across multiple settings. A lot of information in just a small chunk of data. So the two cost measures are the total per capita cost. Actually, I'm going to flip it around. I talk about Medicare spending per beneficiary first. So Medicare spending per beneficiary, MSPD, is calculated based on what Medicare pays for services performed by an individual clinician or TIN, so if you're solo or in a group, during the Medicare spending per beneficiary episode. Now that episode comprises patient care that starts three days prior to an acute care hospital admission, the entire time that patient is admitted, and then it goes for 30 days post-hospital admission. So depending on how long the patient was in the hospital, you have 33 days before and 30 after that are included in this MSPB episode. So it's all of the care during that period of time. So the total per capita cost, that's more of a global look at the cost. So you're looking at the calculated um, claims from Medicare Part A and Part B, so that's usually inpatient and outpatient services, over the whole NIPS performance period, so this year, so all of 2018, again, for patients attributed to that clinician or that team. 
This one's a little different than the Medicare spending for beneficiary, where patients are only attributed to one clinician or ten, and then it looks at the different specialties, which we'll talk about a little later on, because this measure is very nuanced in how it looks at all the ways that patients are attributed to clinicians and how you're scored and risk adjusted. So keep in mind a couple of things as we go through. So um, as I mentioned, the two performance measures that you have to report on or that you know, post data on, the task category score is an average of those two measures. And if for some reason a clinician doesn't or a practice doesn't have data to support both of those measures, you would be scored only on one of the measures. If there's no data for either of the measures or not adequate data, then the cost performance category becomes 0% of your MIPS score, and then the quality category would move up and become 60% of your MIPS score, similar to how it was in 2017. In order to meet the required case minimums for the MSPB measure, clinicians and TIMS, regardless of how you're reporting, must have at least 35 uh, MSPB episodes. And for the total per capita cost or TPCC measure, you have to have at least 20 episodes or um, cases. So just keep those two values in mind. Again, they're, it's kind of similar to the low volume threshold, whether you're reporting as an individual or as a group, you have to meet it at whatever level you're reporting at. So it's 35 as an individual or 35 as a group. Same with TPCC, it's 20 as an individual and 20 as a group. All right, here comes the fun part. So the Medicare spending per beneficiary measure is the sum of the ratio of payment standardized observed to expected costs for all MSPB episodes, uh, encounters, over the total number of encounters that you have for the Medicare spending per beneficiary. So that's divided, gives you the total score. Seems really simple, right? So I know this is a very small slide. I'm trying to give you guys information so that you have it if you want to look back at the slides. So the there's a number of exclusions that come into this as you try to figure out, well, who falls into my MSPB episode? You have to take into account a couple beneficiary exclusions. The first exclusion is that beneficiaries were not continuously enrolled in Medicare Parts A and Part B, and this is a funny number, for 93 days prior to the start of that initial admission, and we call it the index admission, is that first admission. The reason for this is that CMS looks at some information from the CMS hierarchical condition coding, and if there isn't adequate data for 90 days prior to that admission, remember it starts three days, the MSCB encounter starts three days prior to the actual admission, then they can't group the patient effectively enough. So it's really about 93 days. The next is if the patient happens to die during the encounter, they fall out of the population, if the patient was discharged um, from the index admission, so that very first encounter, and an incur that index encounter occurred within 30 days of the last uh, 30 days of the performance period. So because you have to have that 30 day run out, let's say a patient was discharged from the hospital December 15th, because there's only 15 days left in the performance year, that patient would fall out because they don't have enough data to pull those 30 days post discharge. The index admission for the episode is involved in another acute to acute hospital transfer. So let's say the patient is admitted, um, maybe needs to have some sort of procedure done at another facility and has to be transferred to another facility, uh, they would also fall out of that population. The beneficiary was enrolled in Medicare Advantage Plan or Medicare as the secondary payer. So we often talk about those additional payers depending on where the the payments are coming from. So if the Medicare was a secondary payer or Medicare Advantage, any time during that 90-day look-back period, they would also um, fall out of the population. The other is that the index admission occurred during uh, the last 30 days of a previous MSPB episode. So those are those patients that get readmitted within 30 days. So you can't actually have two MSPB episodes um, kind of concurrently occurring. So Let's say a patient was admitted uh, January 1st. Well, actually, that, that was still work. So they would take three days prior to that to so go back to December 28th of 2017. Admission occurs January 1st. Let's say they get discharged on January 10th. 30 days post period would be somewhere between January 10th and, you're going to test my math, 
February 9th. If another admission occurred any time between January 10th and February 9th, that patient would fall out because you can't start the second MSPB episode while you're still running out that first. So that's really important for, again, those healthy and um, appropriate transitions, making sure that those patients are getting the appropriate care when they need it so that hopefully they can stay within the home or wherever they go uh, that full 30-day period and then, again, hopefully longer than that so that you're not seeing your costs escalate because they're frequently being readmitted. The index admission uh, for the inpatient claim includes a $0 actual payment or $0 standardized payment. I'm not sure exactly when that would happen, but for whatever reason, Medicare wasn't being billed anything, so there's no claim to go back to because there's no cost to be evaluated. So we're going to go through some steps in how we calculate this measure. I'll just let you know now it's seven steps, but there's some sub-steps, so it's really about ten. So the first is defining the population. So as we talked about, it's really important first to look at those patient exclusions because those are really who set those encounters. So if a patient had an applicable admission, did they fall into any of those exclusionary groups? If they did, then obviously they come out. But if they didn't, then they would be part of your initial uh, population. It's really important, again, to think about that index admission versus the readmission. So an index admission is the first admission that occurs. A readmission is any subsequent admission that occurs during that 30-day period post-discharge. So index happens, any readmission is 30 days after. If you have an index admission and a readmission within 30 days, the next admission would, be, again, become your index admission, and you follow the process down the line throughout the year. The next step is to calculate the payment standardized MSPD episode cost. So here's where we start getting into the really technical stuff. <laughs> so you'll want to sum all of the standardized Medicare payments, claims payments made for care provided during that MSPD episode. I'm going to jump ahead of slides because we're going to talk about payment standardization next. So the reason why Medicare payment standardizes is that, as you can imagine, across the country, there are various different charge rates, uh, reimbursement rates, things that affect care and or the cost of care outside of the actual care itself. So by payment standardizing, CMS is eliminating those adjustments made for payments that might be affected by regional labor costs or practice expenses such as hospital wages or geographic labor cost index. So it's really important to take that into consideration because obviously that might either artificially inflate or deflate your cost and you want them to really be on that level playing field so that you get measured appropriately. It also substitutes a national amount for cases and services that are paid based on the state fee schedule. So each state might have slightly different fee schedules. It's really important to take that into consideration. Payment standardization also eliminates payments to hospitals um, that have larger goals, such as maybe providing uh, graduate indirect education expenses or disproportionate population services if they have a significant population of poor or uninsured patients. Uh, that might throw off their cost a little. And it also pulls out any payments that are associated with incentive payments from programs such as um, the inpatient prospective payment system or meaningful use or really any of the other programs that might be going on that could potentially inflate or deflate costs and payments. And again, this preserves the differences that are results of healthcare uh, delivery choices. So really CMS is looking at how is the care provided, was it appropriate, was it timely, uh, not necessarily how expensive was it. So it's really important to level the playing field. As I talk about the payment standardization, there's a couple of different approaches to payment standardization that I don't have on the slides here, but I just want you to be aware of. So the first is approach A, which uses a claim allowed amount, and that's an amount set nationally by CMS. That method isn't used for that many different types of services. In the hospital setting, it's really only used for the Part A drug, which, as you can remember from the Bipartisan Budget Act, actually came out of the equation for the low volume threshold. Now, it's still part of the cost component, but it came out of that low volume threshold calculation. Also, lab services that use any sort of automated processing, those also typically use um, the approach A. The second, which is more common, is approach B. And Approach B uses services that are not paid at a national rate, and it takes into account any sort of add-ons or deductions. And the add-ons or deductions 
are, again, those graph, geographic variances that might occur and other special programs such as the graduate education or other programs that might be going on within the healthcare setting that would affect their payments. There really aren't outlier payments, but if there were outlier payments, so those would be payments that are significantly higher or lower, those would also come out, but in this case, there really, there's no need to pull those out. But so, approach B goes for, most of the time, physician services, uh, lab services that don't use the automated approach, and anesthesia, anesthesia services. It also affects those inpatient uh, claims, so really, pretty much all settings that you would be working with would go through approach B. There's one final approach, approach C, that if nothing meets the for J or approach B, there's an additional calculation where they look at services not paid at the national rate, there's not enough information to use approach A or approach B, and then there's those additional adjustments are taken into account and they see you know, that comes up with a sort of average standardized payment. So as you can see, it's very complex. There's a lot that goes into this calculation. The next piece, oops, actually I want to jump back one, sorry. We'll go back one. So once you get the payment standardized MSPB episode cost, you jump down to the next step, step three. And this is where we calculate the expected episode cost. If you have questions about this, it does get a little complex. Um, there's some great CMS tools. This is right from um, the Medicare Spending Card Beneficiary Fact Sheet, page six to 10 and 12. There's some um, tables that are really helpful towards the end of the fact sheet if you have questions about the HCC coding. So to calculate the expected episode cost, you would take each of the MSTV episodes and utilizing the model uh, through the HCC, so that's the hierarchical condition category, you would risk adjust. And so the way that the CMS um, hierarchical condition categories work is it takes into account several things. So the first, I'm gonna jump ahead, is that there's um, accounting for the case mix and it adjusts for age and severity of illness. So oftentimes, obviously, patients have varying degrees of illness or comorbidities. So in the first step, patients are pulled out using um, the major diagnostic category, so the MDC of that specific MSTV encounter. And from there, each of the Medicare severity diagnosis related groups, or MSD, DRGs, many of you probably just know in DRG, for that index admission are identified. And this goes off of where they are in terms of uh, admission diagnosis, any other comorbidities going on. From there, CMS looks at those 79 hierarchical conditions and identifies whether there are appropriate um, combination. So again, there's 79. It doesn't account for every single different condition, but there are obviously those that are much higher in terms of cost and complexity. And then it also looks at age and the sex of the patient, because depending on your age and your sex, you might have higher risk or cost associated with the care. As I mentioned, having the patient have that 90-day look back or 93-day look back is critical, because so that's where that HCC score comes from is that CMS looks at the 90 days of claims prior to the start of that episode to identify where you're at. They also look to see if you use any sort of long-term care services, so were you in any sort of rehab, um, did you have end-stage renal disease, sort of what was your, your draw on the system at that point, and do you fall into a higher risk score than maybe other people do. The HCC coding is off of um, version 22, if you're curious, and there's over 9,500 ICD-10 codes linked up to those 79 HCC codes. You can imagine how distinct and specific some of those codes can really get. So once you risk adjust, we'll move on to step four. So I thought this was the most fun part when I was going through all of this, and my colleague, Radhika, who's in the room, <laughs> got to see me try to figure out. I'm, I'm not a mathematician. I'll start right there. I'm not my strong suit. I can do math, but not a mathematician. Uh, and there's very complex math principles in this. So in step 4.1, you start by excluding outliers. And it's not just the high-cost outliers. So the MSTB episode, you're looking at Winds rising expected cost. And some of you are probably like, what is winds rising? So winds rising is really a specific term for truncating. So it used to be called truncate. There was a mathematician or Windsor of something who got this process named after him. 
So within the MSTB measure, what you do is you take the bottom 0.5%, 0.5%, and all of those values below 0.5 get moved up to whatever that 0.5 value is. You have nothing below whatever your sample has as 0.5. So that's all winterizing is. It's also called bottom coding, again, truncating. You can really call it whatever you want as long as you cap your lowest score at 0.5. The next step is also excluding outliers, but this is more of that typical outlier exclusion where you're looking at both the top 99th percent and bottom first percentile. And again, you're removing those values so that they're equal. You don't want to have all of those sort of outliers that might throw off your cost based on where they fall. Um, CMS is really looking to, again, standardize the cost across the whole sample. There's a renormalization in there. Again, I'm not a mathematician, so you probably don't want to have me explain that to you, but as you can imagine, it's very complex looking at a lot of data, a lot of numbers, and where your patients are falling within your sample. I think I have a slide on this, so we'll just quickly look at that. So winds rising, as I mentioned, you truncate all predicted values below the 0.5 percentile to assign them to the value of that 0.5 percentile. The lowest predicted um, Medicare diagnostic category value, so it's looking again at those different values and making sure that they all kind of equal across the board. Removing outliers, you're looking at that residual after you winds rise, and then you're calculating the difference between those standardized, standardized episode costs, so summing all your Medicare claims, during that MSPB episode, you do your Windsorization, and then you move on and you take the residuals that fall above the 99th percentile and below the first percentile, um, they get excluded from your sample. We'll hop back. So <clears throat> moving on to step five. So next, you get to attribute all those episodes to a specific clinician or tent. And so depending on how you report, you would report consistently across the category. Similar to all the other performance categories, you'd want to make sure you're either reporting as an individual or as a group. Again, this is really dependent on how you choose to um, identify your reporting and what makes the most sense for your practice. So for each MSPB episode, it gets attributed to a single clinician or a TIN, depending on where you're at. And this looks at the plurality of Medicare Part B services during that index admission. Again, you're probably thinking, well, what's plurality of services mean? So this is really looking at all of those services and seeing who provided the most services during that period. That's really all plurality means, is who provided the most during that period. Move forward. So this is how an episode is attributed to a given clinician or practice. So again, plurality of services is the clinician or TIN providing the beneficiary with the majority of their services rendered under that Medicare Part B, so physician fee schedule, mostly primary care related, um, than any other clinician. So each MSTB episode is attributed to a single clinician, again, based on the plurality of services. If more than one clinician has a plurality of services, so let's say two clinicians uh, provided the equal number of services to the patient, that patient uh, would be attributed to the clinician that had the most Medicare Part B service lines. So the number of line items on their claims, whichever of those clinicians or groups have more lines of service, they would get the clinic. They would get that patient. Now, if both of those clinicians or TINs have the same number of claims and the same number of service lines, that patient would be attributed randomly to one of those two clinicians or TINs. I always find that kind of amazing that CMS is randomly attributing a patient based on cost. But I digress. Next, we'll move on to uh, risk adjustment. So in step 6.1 so for the MSPB episode, you divide the MSPB episode's total standardized cost by that total winterized and renormalized expected cost. Oops, can't. Oh. Sorry, I thought I had a slide for that one. I guess I don't. So that's just the ratio um, dividing those two values. From there, you would get the actual MSPB measure for the TIN or MPI. Again, it depends on how you are reporting. Um, this is calculated using that risk adjustment episode cost ratio. And then you take the two ratios 
and you average them out for each of the clinicians. That average cost ratio is then multiplied by that national average expected cost. That's, again, based on standardization of all of the MSTV costs across um, all of the universe of attributed non-outlier episodes, and that brings you to your MSTV measure total. From there, it's reported to that specific clinician or PIN, and you're given your value. For the MSTV measure within the MIPS program, you would be able to earn anywhere between 1 and 10 points. The category is worth a total of 20 points, um, and so the TPCC measure is also worth 1 to 10 points. You average those together. We'll talk about the actual breakdown towards the end. And with that, we will move on to the total per capita cost. So, hope you're all having fun. It's a very complex topic, as you can see. So, TPCC is the sum of annualized risk-adjusted, specialty-adjusted Medicare Part A and Part C claims across all attributed beneficiaries. So that was a mouthful. Over the total number of attributed beneficiaries that's you to your TPCC measure score. So, how do you find out all those lovely patients that are attributed to you? <laughs> so, just like the MSTB measures, there are just a couple exclusions you want to take into account. <laughs> the first is that the beneficiary was not continu continuously enrolled in either Medicare Part A or Part B during the performance period. So, if they lost coverage at any point during the full calendar year of 2018, then they would fall out of your population, although that's not entirely true, so we'll talk about that towards the end or as we go through the process. Uh, the beneficiary was enrolled in a private Medicare health plan for any month during the performance period. So, again, that's probably meaning that Medicare was not the primary payer. Again, really needs to be the primary payer. And then, finally, the, Medica the beneficiary resided outside the United States, so if they potentially got care elsewhere, uh, they fall out of your population. So, we'll go through the same step process. This also has about eight steps. Uh, the first is that you attribute beneficiaries to the TIN or NPI. So, again, that beneficiary, a single beneficiary, will only be attributed to a single clinician or the TIN, depending on how you choose to report. Again, the process really looks at that plurality of services. We'll get into that now. So, there's two steps. Uh, very interesting steps in how the whole process works. So the first is that the beneficiary is attributed to the clinician or TIN if that beneficiary receives more primary care services. And now don't think of it as just primary care services. They have to be rendered by a certain clinician type. And so this is looking at those primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, clinical nurse specialists, at that TIN or MPI combo than any other TIN or MPI combo or CMS certification number, CCN, so it's a hospital. So they, that patient had more primary care services rendered by one of those clinician types at some TIN or MPI combo, then they would be attributed to that TIN or MPI combo. Now, if that beneficiary receives most of their primary care services from a CCN, oh, sorry, so CNN, should be CCN, then they would be um, attributed to that CCN and would not be risk-adjusted because of the way the hospital side of things work. If, again, two NPI or TIN combos have exactly the same share of the beneficiary's primary care services, then the beneficiary would be attributed to whichever TIN NPI had um, provided primary care services to that beneficiary most recently. So, that's the first step. Now, let's say the beneficiary didn't meet any of those criteria. What happens next? So, if the beneficiary did not receive any primary care services from a PCP, an NP, a PA, or CNS um, during the performance period, but that beneficiary received more primary care services from a non-primary care physician. So, this is really worth looking at that physician type um, and then the specialty within a TIN or MPI combo or CCN, then they would be attributed to that TIN or MPI combo. Now, again, if two MPI TIN combos have the same share of the beneficiary's primary care services, then, again, the beneficiary would be attributed to the TIN MPI combo that provides primary care services most recently. If the beneficiary received more primary care services from a non-primary care physician at a CCN, again, a CNS, 
then the patient would be attributed to that CCN. It would not be risk-adjusted. We'll talk about risk-adjusting in just a few minutes. And if the primary, if the beneficiary did not receive any primary care services from any PCP, MP, TA, CNS, or other non-primary care physician, then that beneficiary would not be attributed to any TIN or MPI or CCN. So as you can imagine, if they don't get any primary care services, they fall out of this pool altogether. Uh, let me jump back. Sorry, skip the step. So once you get all of your attributed beneficiaries, next you need to calculate the payment standardized per capita cost. So the payment standardized uh, standardization takes into account any of those add-ons and geographical variations. So we talked about it a little a few moments ago with the MSTB measure. It's no different than that in the TPCC measure. So again, it eliminates payments made that reflect any sort of um, regional labor cost variances, substitutes that national amount for payments made, based on values, any of those organizations using um, graduate and direct medical education or disproportionate population coverage or any of those incentive payments, really looking at total um, cost of care. I apologize, went one step too far. Next, the TPCC measure looks at annualizing costs. And so when you think about annualizing costs, this measure, because it's looking at all Medicare Part A and Part B claims for the whole calendar year, so all of 2018, it's really important to understand what your attributed beneficiary's estimated or total Medicare cost was for that full year. So beneficiaries uh, that don't have a full year worth of data, so let's say um, they joined late in the year due to their birthday or they passed away sometime during the year, CMS will keep them within your population. For this measure, as you recall, there was no um, exclusion if you happen to pass away during the performance period. You actually remain within your population. But if you don't have a full calendar year's worth of data, CMS has to try to uh, generalize and figure out what your annual cost would be. So the example is if, if the patient had claims from January to September, let's say they had um, – What's a good round number? A thousand dollars in claims from January to September. That would be uh, three quarters of the year. So as you well, actually, let's do. They have seven hundred and fifty dollars. That'll make it a little easier for me. So they have seven hundred and fifty dollars in claims from January to September, which comes out to be seventy-five percent of the year. Because that last quarter is unknown. CMS has to try to sort of equalize it, so they would take whatever that percentage would be, so each month they have roughly $100 in claims. Or, no, nope, you're going to test my math, and I don't have a calculator in front of me, so I'm just going to add it up. For the full year, they would have $1,000 in Medicare Part C claims, roughly Part A and Part B claims, so they would just get an $1,000 as an annual cost estimate. It's whatever portion of the year they have data for, you divide that by that portion of the calendar year. So, again, every month comes 112, and then you figure out from there roughly what their annual cost would be. Very technical term, annualizing, not such a technical process, although clearly maybe you tested my math. Um, next, we will look at step four, which is risk-adjusting cost. We talked about this a little before, but not quite as much. So, in risk-adjusting, beneficiaries are attributed to that single clinic clinician or 10, and then the measures that influence the health status of the diagnoses and any treatment costs, um, rather than capturing the influence of the treatment for that actual care. So you're looking at what costs the clinician and the provider money for the care. So to risk adjust, I apologize, the screen's kind of small. Again, <laughs> CMS does um, Windsorizing the pre capita or per capita cost, so that's truncating all predicted values. Unlike with the MSPV measure where they go to the lowest 0.5 percentile, uh, the TPCC measure looks at the first percentile and 99th percentile, and you get assigned values for both of those. That's the Windsorization process. There's also, again, another renormalization. We won't get into that as much because, again, it's a complex math principle that you don't want me to explain. From there, those values are looked at in terms of those hierarchical condition category risk scores. So that's um, a two-part process. Unlike the uh, MSPB measure, there's two pieces to it. Um, so patients 
expected costs relative to other beneficiaries are looked at, and there's two models. So there's one model for new enrollees within Medicare, and there's a model for existing or continuing enrollees. So the new enrollees, the model looks at um, patient's age, sex, disability status. So that's really looking at um, are they currently designated as being disabled or not. Also, it looks at the reason for Medicare entitlement. So some patients become entitled to Medicare services due to a disability and some age into the program. So it's looking to see how did you become eligible. So I also have on here Medicaid. It should be Medicare eligibility. I apologize. And then it also looks at the HCC coding. So that's for um, both new and existing. New, they don't take into account that HCC coding because they don't have 12 months worth of previous data to look back and say what was the patient's previous diagnoses, care, and where do they fall in terms of that risk. The second piece to identifying risk is that was the patient part or do they currently have an active diagnosis of end-stage renal disease? As you can imagine, patients with end-stage renal disease often have to get um, significant dialysis services, which can be very costly. So CMS is looking at those two components to identify risk. Based on this whole scoring, <clears throat> if a patient receives an HPC risk score of one, they are considered to be right within that average nationwide beneficiary risk population. If their score is greater than one, they are above average risk, and if they are below one, they are below average risk. Again, complex, lots of coding in the background based on claims. Hot back one. The next, we will look at the national average per capita cost for each specialty. So as I mentioned, specialty within this is a very, within this specific measure is a very critical component. So the national specialty specific cost is weighed against all of the average clinician costs. It weighs each based on the number of beneficiaries attributed to that clinician or TIN, and it also accounts for the number and share of practitioners within that specific TIN, within that specific identified specialty. We'll jump ahead. All right, so for specialty adjusting, <clears throat> clinicians have to be identified by um, a certain number of specialty codes. There's a handful specific to primary care. Those look at physicians and nurse practitioners. Again, I can tell you quickly what they are. Um, so physicians. General practice clinicians are 0, 1, family clinicians are 0, 8, internal med is 11, geriatric medicine is 38. Non-physician non practitioners such as nurse um, practitioners are 50, physician assistants are 97, and clinical nurse specialists are 89. So those, again, are those primary codes that you're looking at for primary care practitioners providing care. Anyone outside of that falls into a whole host of other codes that we have. If you have questions about, they're also available on those CMS health guides. So looking at those specific specialty codes for the practice type, you also have to go by the Medicare Part B services rendered during that performance period. So again, if there's a tie, then the specialty with the most recent claim is then selected. So let's say within your practice you have uh, five general practice clinicians and five family practitioners you would have a tie between clinicians with a specialty designation of 01 and 08. So how would you decide? It would be based on whichever one had the most recent claims. Once a specific specialty is identified for that, either the clinician obviously has that one specialty that they're designated at, but the group of the 10, then that specialty is determined. <clears throat> and that's what that group would be um, evaluated on. Then the specialty uh, gets evaluated, so each eligible per each eligible professional is included, and CMS adjusts the cost based on that share and proportion of that specialty within the group. Because obviously, if you have mostly family practitioners, or maybe a handful of cardiologists or urologists or whatever the case may be in a specialty a mixed setting, then you would need to identify who has the um, appropriate proportion of patients. And then adjust their costs accordingly. From there, you construct the specialty adjusted cost. So this is multiplying the ratio of risk adjusted cost to that specialty adjusted expected cost by the national average per capita cost for all the clinicians of TIN. Oh, no, no, no slide on that one. And then from there, you would calculate the measure. So this is um, 
measured by calculating all of those different ratios, multiplication and step 5.3, and you get the denominator and numerator that we talked about previously. Finally, it's then reported out to each MPI or PIN based on how you report. I'm sure you all probably have googly eyes right now, like, oh my gosh, she just told me so much information I don't even know what to do. I see there are no questions in the chat, which always makes me a little concerned that there are no questions, but hopefully this was helpful. I want to briefly talk about the cost performance category, and then we'll talk about some cost containment strategies, and then I want to allow questions at the end. So as I mentioned, each of the measures within the category has a total of 10 points possible in this example. Uh, total per capita cost earns 5.6 points, and Medicare spending per beneficiary earns 7.2. You get a total of 12.8. 12.8 divided by 20 equals 0 0.64. You multiply that by the 10% of the category, and you would get a total score of 6.4 missed points. So, a little more than half of the category score. Couple things that you should uh, do now. So familiarize yourself with previous performance. If you don't have an EIDM account to access the portal and get your 2016 QRUR reports, please make sure to get that. If you need help, we are happy to help you with that. Compare previous performance to national averages. So how does your organization or practice compare? Keep in mind that data is roughly a year old, so you might have put different cost containment strategies into place, uh, but you probably won't see those until obviously it's been a little time and claims have gone through the system. Consider implementing cost containment strategies, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Determine current organizational practice initiatives and strategy goals. Identify opportunities for population health or going into a medical home model or other program implementations. If you haven't seen them before, uh, this is what a QRUR report would look like. So this is showing you the cost measures. There's the per, total per capita cost for all attributed beneficiaries, the total number of eligible cases, the cost, your standardized score, your domain score. This is, again, coming up to QRUR, national mean, and then some standard deviation information. Get a little more idea of where you stand. If you really want to break it down, I know this is very tiny, but this is a little more information on the different um, physician services that are billed, where you shake out in terms of total number of attributed beneficiaries, percentage of beneficiaries um, with that service in the category, total per capita cost, like gives you an idea of sort of where your different service lines might be billing to and where you should maybe look at containing some of those costs. Again, we're happy to look over that with you if you have additional questions. I understand this is tiny. And here's another breaking down the total per capita cost, looking at encounter codes, procedures, ancillary services, hospice, gives you a little more information about where you might find your utilization. So my last three minutes, I just quickly want to talk about cost containment strategies. So as you can imagine, CMS is looking at costs, as you know, already becoming 10% of your MIT score, moving up to 30% over the next couple of years. So if you haven't already, and if it's something that your organization is interested in, consider a population health management tool. So identify conditions and patients that use a lot of services. So who are those high utilizers? Typically, it's patients with the chronic care diseases, so diabetes, heart disease, um, COPD. And then identify care coordination programs. Are there ways that you can better coordinate the care for those patients? Um, look at medical home models. So do you want to do something with bundled or global payments? Is that an option? Have you considered becoming um, patient-centered medical home recognized? Or if you're a specialty, patient-centered medical home um, specialty recognized? And again, that's increasing coordination of care and communication across multiple settings of care. Uh, we talked about MIP measures, but for those of you thinking about moving into an alternative payment model, there are always accountable care organizations to consider. In this model, all providers that participate, accept risk associated with the quality and cost of care provided to those attributed beneficiaries. And there is a hope that there's an increased efficiency across the organization. So you're helping to coordinate care, again, between multiple settings and can identify um, maybe better resource utilization. Also, um, obviously, CMS is moving towards this performance-based repayment. It's not going away. So there's been a progressive shift from pay-for-service to pay-for-performance. And there are penalties for poor performance or lack of reporting. So if you say, you know what, I just don't care, 
you will probably get a penalty in 2018. The penalties, if you choose to do nothing, are 5% from your Medicare Part B claims in um, 2020. So just keep that in mind. Start thinking about quality and patient safety initiatives. There's quite a few that can help with resource utilization. Um, identify opportunities for improvement within your current practice or organization. Do you want to monitor infection rates or prescribing patterns? We know that the opioid crisis is also not going away, and there's definitely progressive need for programs to help reduce um, opioid prescribing. Look at events that result in patient injury. Obviously, those drastically increase healthcare spend, and it's really important to identify ways to reduce maybe fall rates within the hospital. And as always, look at optimizing workflows. So perform root cause analysis or a PDSA cycle to evaluate your clinical and operational workflows. Uh, we see this a lot with check-in, check-out processes that provide or account for bottlenecks, increased costs because patients get frustrated, they need additional support, whatever the case might be. Um, consider assessing your electronic documentation tools to optimize clinician needs when applicable. Obviously, if you can help your clinicians report more effectively, that reduces time. I briefly just want to jump ahead. We'll do questions. Um, I'm going to just show you the resources. So the cost guides are available under this first link on the uh, CMS QPP website. Also a link to the MIPS participation status lookup tool and the portal. I see one question, two questions in the chat that I want to address. If you have questions that you would like to ask over the phone, feel free to press uh, pound six to unmute your line. Uh, let's see. <laughs> what is the impact if a patient enters the hospital under a Medicare uh, BPCI bundle and therefore Medicare pays a fixed amount for their care over 90 days? That's a great question. I am not sure, but off the top of my head, I'm going to say that oftentimes you have to look at if that hits the Medicare Part B services, so coming from the um, Part A and Part B services, which I don't believe the bundles do because of the way they negotiate those payments, but I'm happy to look into that more for you. Uh, if we are a one-physician cardiology practice that provides no in-hospital services and no primary care, what happens when one of our patients gets admitted despite our best efforts? Yeah, great question, right? You're not going into the hospital and you're not seeing those um, patients' primary care. They would still be attributed to you if during those different algorithms to identify attributed patients, you happen to provide um, the greater number of services or for the Medicare spending per beneficiary, they would still be attributed to you um, because you would have been identified as one of their care providers. Now, I can't say that for sure because, again, I haven't seen the claims to say where you fall in terms of the care process, but you would likely get some portion of that patient. Uh, the QR you are report is quite dense and confusing. Yes, I 100% agree with you. Is there any online tool or similar service to help us make sense of our QRURs or explain what we need to be looking at or focus on? Um, unfortunately, no. There's no quick uh, guide to the QRUR. They're very complex and weighty. I would say if you have questions, I'm going to go a slide ahead. Feel free to email me. Um, my office handles all of uh, my organization actually handles all of New England. If you're not in New England, I'm happy to connect you to one of the um, other Quinn Quos across the country and make sure that you get support on identifying how you can better utilize your QRUR. But it's not a quick, easy answer, um, and unfortunately there is no tool to help you quickly get through all of that data. Uh, you mentioned population health tools, which ones are good and which ones do you recommend. Um, I can't answer that specifically because I don't know your practice. So I would say I'm happy to talk to you more about what your practice goals are, but it's really dependent on where you're at and what your goals are. It's not really a this tool or this is the best way to go. What would you apply this measure in relationship to an optometry practice reporting code? Um, again, it's dependent on the patients that you're seeing and whether they are admitted or not. I don't know your patient population, so I can't say. Reporting codes um, for the primary care 
uh, TPCC measures, looking at um, typically the codes that are linked to primary care visits. So like HICPICS codes um, 99201 through 99205, for new patient, established patients, 99211 to 99215. There's a whole host I can go through those with you offline if you're interested. But if you bill any of those codes, you'll likely have patients attributed to your provider. Um, I'm not entirely sure what reporting codes you're referring to outside of that, but we're happy to talk to you more about that offline. Again, if you'd like to ask any questions over the phone, it's town six or you can enter it into the chat. Uh, question, is it possible to print or download the slides? And thanks for answering my question. Um, there's a link to the slides. If you scroll up to the top of the chat bar, you can pull the slides right off of our website. Um, are there any more questions? Okay, well, I'm going to close it out. Um, thank you, everyone, for a great discussion. Um, we have a few last-minute announcements before we end today's call. As a reminder, we are now on social media. Visit us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. When you close up this webinar, the evaluation will automatically pop up on your computer. If you could please fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. If you don't have time to fill it out today, or you're currently sharing a computer with someone else, You'll receive an email tomorrow with the link to the evaluation, as well as the link to the event page on our website. The slides are available on the event web page, and within the next few business days, a recording and transcript of this webinar will also be added. I've put that link in the checkbox check again for you, and again, thank you for attending, and have a great day.